All right. So, I guess I'll just get right into it. Where, where Jesus has been uh, calling me back to lately, it's been a really personal time between me and him. I got to share a little bit about it last week, uh, just how he's kind of drawing me into his presence in a really personal way, really unique way, something for me at least. Um, and a big part of what I shared last week was I feel like God's doing a new thing um, here at Kingdom Life, or really just settling into what he's called us to all along. And when he does new things, he'll oftentimes speak to us or speak with us, meet with us in a new way. Uh, and so there's been all sorts of ways in my own personal life where Jesus has found me or called me or challenged me. That's been out of the ordinary for my typical quiet time with him or out of the ordinary for the way I study scripture, out of the ordinary for the things he's asking me to do and in interacting with different parts of my life, different people in my life. He's just calling me to look at things at a different light, not in a new Christian age type of way. I'm not saying it's like a new Christianity that I'm about to preach to you guys. It's nothing like that. It's the old stuff. It's the stuff that's been established for a long time, but it's a new way for me where I've said it before where, you know, it's the glory of God to conceal things, but the glory of kings to search them out. And so some days I'll find him when I'm praising and worshiping, have YouTube going, and man, God enters the room and praise and worship. Other times it's in scripture, studying it, memorizing it, digging into the original language and finding what these words mean, how they were originally intended to be communicated. He finds me there. Other times it's meeting one-on-one -on -one with people. He finds me in new ways and different ways oftentimes. And in this last season, it's been things that I've never tried and never done before. And it's just been really fun and really exciting. So part of that really personal and fun walk he's had with me is he's brought me to uh, the book of Revelation, uh, especially chapters 1, 2, and 3. Um, a part of the Bible that I didn't really discover until I'd been saved for a handful of years was the seven letters that Jesus wrote, or Jesus had John write for him to seven churches uh, at that time. So it's really cool we have First and Second Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Romans, Colossians, all of those letters from Paul or from the other disciples to the different churches in these different cities. First and Second Corinthians was a, two different letters that were written to the church at Corinth. Ephesians, a letter written to the church at Ephesus. Philippians to Philippi, that's kind of the idea. And then in Revelation 2 and 3, we have Jesus saying, hey, write these letters to these seven churches. And it's a really beautiful, really, really beautiful vision that John describes here uh, while he's imprisoned because he was preaching the name of Jesus. Jesus appears to him and says, write these seven letters. Uh, like I said, I didn't discover these or even know about them <laughs> until a few years into my walk. So um, I'm letting you guys in on it just in case you were in a similar boat I was in then, that you'd never known that Jesus <laughs> transcribed some letters. That's a pretty big deal. You want to hear about it, right? So the, the letter he's had me in this past week, uh, is in, starting in chapter 2, if you guys want to turn there to Revelation 2, um, starting in verse 1. And I, I, I'm thinking I'm just going to start reading it for you guys, and then we'll, we'll dig into the different portions of it. Let me start with just praying for us. Thank you, Jesus, that you find us in new ways so often. Thank you for the way you interact with us, the way you speak to us. God, thank you that each individual here, if we went around the room, we could share all sorts of different ways that you've encountered us. God, that you've transformed us, the ways that you've shown up in our lives in all sorts of different ways. Just like the couple testimonies we heard here, we go around this whole room and each of us probably has different ways that you've transformed us and encountered us. Thank you for doing that. And Jesus, I pray here this morning that the words of your scripture, the words that you spoke to John would go into people's hearts and settle in, and God, that they would take root. God, I pray that anything that would just come from me or my own mind would fall short of people's hearts, but God, words that are inspired by you would settle into people's hearts and really grow into something beautiful. We love you, and we thank you for the ways that you love us. We pray these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. So Revelation 2. I read you guys chapter 1, verses 9 through 20 last week, just talking about the magnificence of Jesus. It gives a really beautiful description of who Jesus is when he appears. He's like, oh, my gosh. And it says he literally, I fell down on my face as though dead after he saw him. It's a pretty dynamic description of who Jesus is when he showed up to him. And then in chapter 2, he says, this is Jesus talking here. He says, to the angel of the church of Ephesus, write the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands. And at the intro of each one of these letters, he gives a little bit of description. You see all this beautiful 
language describing who Jesus is. And he says here that I'm the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands. Uh, Just for reference, if you go back one verse to the end of chapter 1, he describes what those seven stars and those seven golden lampstands are. He says, as for the mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels or the messengers or pastors of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. So I hold the seven leaders of the seven church in my right hand, and I'm walking amongst the seven churches that I'm writing these letters to. I'm in and out of, around, and with these churches. And in this, as I did some reading, it's, it's really interesting because it's like he's writing to the angel, it says. And that's, in my mind, I was like, what is, go- this is neat, this is unique. What's go- what does he mean by he's writing to the angel at the church of Ephesus? And I think, really, like I looked at the, the, it's translated messengers, it's even, it says, hey, common sense says it's a pastor, is what one of the guys said, uh, just because if Jesus is going to have you write a letter, it's probably to a human, not to an angel. If it was an angelic being, he'd probably just tell them directly, and a letter wouldn't need to be written in the natural to deliver a message to an angel, um, which there's people that still disagree about it, but to the angel, to the leader, to the messenger or the pastor at the church of Ephesus, He goes into this in verse 2. He says, I know your works. And he opens up almost every letter like that. I know your works. I'm walking among you, and I know what you're doing. I know your works, your toil, and your patient endurance, and how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not and found them to be false. I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary This right here, guys, right to that verse, the end of verse 3 right there, you could preach a message just on those verses. Because we're talking about the words of Jesus complimenting a church, and I can even relate to this church in a number of ways. I know your works, I know your toil, I know the way that you have patiently endured for me, he says, and I know that you are continuing to endure patiently for me. I know that you have bared up for my name, you've had to endure persecution, but you've worked hard, you've been righteous Jesus doesn't just talk about here. If you go back to Matthew 5 even, Matthew 5, he says, in the Sermon on the Mount, this is Jesus when he's still alive, says, Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. And here he's saying, I know you've had to endure persecution for my name, You've stayed steadfast and patient. I know that you have strong leadership there that's not afraid of conflict, that you've handled it appropriately, that you've tested and you've discerned out these people who have come in and said, I'm an apostle of the Lord. You tested them, found out they were false, confronted it, and dealt with it. That's good, strong leadership in this church. Galatians 6, 9 says, And let us not grow weary in doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. And Jesus is saying here, I know that you have endured patiently, bearing up for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary. You have not grown weary. You have continued to stay the course. And we know in due season, if we continue to do good works, if we continue to not give up, we will reap in the Spirit what we have sown in the Spirit. You could preach a whole message on these few verses right here. It's all throughout Scripture, what Jesus is saying here. You're doing a good job. I'm here to encourage you, to edify you, to build you up, to say keep going after it. Right? You could stop there, but that's not where Jesus stops because he says a lot of nice things to this church, but the main message that he wants to be delivered is, coming, is in verse 4 and 5 right here. Verse 4 says, But I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place of influence unless you repent. The Passion Translation, one that Bill's turned me on to, it's a really, it's a beautiful translation of the Bible. I just read that from the English Standard Version. A lot of people use the NIV. Um, Here, the Passion Translation says this, but I have this against you. You have abandoned the passionate love you had for me at the beginning. The message version says like this, you have walked away from your first love. From your first love, from the passionate love you once had for me, from the love and the works that came out of that love at the beginning, that has faded. And for me, I don't know about you guys, when I think of first love, I obviously think of my wife. I think of the passion that I have for her and the 
way I'm so wholeheartedly in pursuit of her heart, and especially right at the beginning, that was ridiculous. <laughs> right? And here he's saying, you guys are consistent. You guys are steady. You guys are strong. You guys handle conflict well. You have patiently endured. You have been persecuted for my name, and you have remained steadfast. I am proud of the works you're doing. But I have this still against you. I want you to return. Remember, you have fallen away from the passionate love you had for me at the beginning. You have left your first love. And again, you see marriages that are good, healthy, strong marriages. We've talked about it even here before, that some days you, don't, you might not feel that passionate, romantic love, but it's still your responsibility to choose to love your spouse, right? Oftentimes, love is a choice, not just a feeling, not just romance. But he's saying, I don't want this to just be a responsibility. I am appreciative of your righteousness and the choices and the sacrifice and the way you've been weary in doing good, but what I'm calling you back to is repent back to the passionate first love feeling you had at the beginning. And it says, if you don't repent, I'm going to remove you from your place of influence. Man. Like I said, when I first fell in love with my wife, I was ridiculous. And most of us can think back to falling in love for the first time or when things first get started in a serious relationship and you start falling for this person, the emotions that you feel they are ridiculous, right? That first love, that falling in love feeling means I'm going to spend a little bit too much money on her. I'm going to stay up a little bit too late with her. I'm going to drive a little bit too far for her. It's not a big deal at all. Of course I am. I remember when we first started dating, I was working hard. I was working in Muskegon, but I lived up in Twin Lake, and she lived a half hour away in Spring Lake. And every day when I got to work, sometime between 4.30 and 6, I would drive from Muskegon to her house shower at her house, be ready, and hang out with her whole family until way too late. It didn't matter, right? Midnight, 12.30, 1 a.m., too late. Until she fell asleep, and I could tuck her in, put her to bed, and then I would drive a half hour home to Twin Lake. And, right? <laughs> it's adorable. Drive a half hour home to Twin Lake and wake up again sometime between 5 and 6, depending on when I had to be at work the next day. Work the whole day, leave from work, I have my change of clothes with me, I'm back at her house six days a week, all the time. Of course I'm the one driving to her, of course I'm the one that's going to stay with her, I'm going to sacrifice. It would be ridiculous not to do these things is how I felt. I was head over heels in love with her, right? It's that love that makes you do stupid things. It was stupid. But I, I, was, I was ready and willing to do anything. I would go hang out with people that I don't even like if Abby was there. I would try new things that I would never do outside of her. But she was there, so okay, yeah, I guess I'll try ice skating. I, I would, I'd have no desire. I'm terrible at everything that, I don't have my feet on the ground, I'm terrible at it. Right? Snowboarding, wheels, skateboards, anything, I'm bad. I'm just bad at it. I don't have that coordination skill set. But if she's there, yeah, okay, I'll go. Snowboarding, cool. I'm going to fall a lot, get injured, but she grew up in the mountains, so she's very good and embarrassing me consistently. I don't care, as long as I'm with her. Right? Literally, I did a vacation Bible school. I was the worship leader dressed up in the whole get-up. They asked me to lead worship at vacation Bible school with a handful of other people. I was like, there is no way that I'm going to do that for four days for free and dance in front of kids and worship. Oh, Abby's doing it? Okay, yeah, I'll do it. <laughs> you're just ridiculous when you're in love, right? I'll do anything on first Valentine's Day. I spent way too much money. I didn't have money. Let's go to the nicest restaurant right? CF Prime, let's get the big 32-ounce T-bone, New York strip on the one side, filet on the other. Of course we're getting dessert. Of course we got flowers. Of course it was, it was no, of course I'm going to spend this money on you. I'm head over heels in love. There's no bound, there's nothing that's going to keep me. You trump everything. I want to make you feel loved. I want to be with you. All of my friends were sick of me talking about Abby. Many of my friends are still sick of me talking about Abby. I get that all the time from the guys I disciple. Like, we get it. You like your wife. We get it, man. I was head over heels in love with this girl, and I was going to sacrifice anything and do anything, spend any amount, travel any distance, because I wanted to be with her more than anything. That was that first love, passionate love. And it's not that we've settled into marriage. Like, I've, I've heard it from Mike before, and I'm, I'm going to keep repeating it, and I'm going to keep living into it, that, yeah, we've been married 45 years, but it's still the honeymoon. Right, Mike? I've heard him say it. That's how I know it. That's how I know Mike and Marilyn have been married that long or still in honeymoon phase. Jesus is saying, come back to the honeymoon. Come back to that love that was inspired, that was passionate, that all you guys are smiling and giggling and laughing because it's fun to hear about. It's worth listening to. It's worth following after. It's worth setting your goals at that level saying, I want that. 
That's attractive. That's good. I want that in my life. I want to work hard for that, sacrifice for that, do whatever I have to do to get to that because it's beautiful. It's that passionate, that inspired love that Jesus is saying. You need to come back to it. I love your work. I I appreciate the patient endurance. I appreciate you being persecuted. I appreciate the conflicts and the things you've had to step up to for my name. But he also says, I know your toil. The word toil in there means you're working harder and harder and harder for less and less and less progress. And he's saying it's, it's good that you're working so hard, but really your influence doesn't come from how hard you're working and how hard you have to endure and the persecution you might receive. Your influence comes from that passionate, inspired, head over heels, honeymoon, passionate love you had for me at the beginning. That's what I want you to come back to. That's what I want you to repent back to. I'm talking about that time in your life when you were most in love with Jesus. For a lot of us, it is right there at the beginning when we fall head over heels in love and realize, wait, Jesus didn't just come and die and come back to life. He did that for me. He rose victorious over death, sin, and the devil for everyone. And it wasn't just everyone. You realized in that moment, wow, no, he did that for me. It's a personal thing. I've been given the gift of grace. He endured torture and the type of death where we, really, we literally get the word excruciating pain from crucifixion. It's that sort of pain he endured for me, for a purpose, to give me this gift of supernatural salvation. Oh my goodness, the closest I think I've ever encountered and experienced to addiction is falling in love with Jesus. Where when I first fell in love with him, I couldn't consume enough of him. Every book I could get my hands on, the whole time I was working manual labor, while I was dating Abby, I had sermons going in my ears 10, 12 hours a day. This is how, that's how I learned to preach. That's how I learned to communicate the gospel. There's a handful of guys that I listened to every sermon they ever preached up to the point of where I was listening because I was head over heels, needed anything and everything, and I wanted to tell everyone. I wanted to keep them for myself, but I wanted everybody to know them. Anywhere where I knew he was happening, where something worshipful was happening or Jesus' name was being shared to those who didn't know him, I wanted to be a part of it. Just let me know where fires are burning. I'm going to sprint to it. I'm going to show up and say, what are we doing? I don't care. Jesus is here, so I'm here. I'll go into situations where I don't even like these people. But for Jesus, I'll show up. Right? He's saying, repent from your works mentality. Repent from your settling. I'm righteous. I'm doing the right things. I'm reading my Bible. I'm being faithful to what he's called me to. I go to church every week. I'm treating people with respect. He's like, Good, I appreciate those things. I encourage those things. I could preach a message of encouragement relating to those things. But he's still saying, repent. Come back to, turn around from the direction you're going and go the opposite way. Go back to where you came from at the beginning when all of your works and all of your persecutions, all the things you gave up for my name, those all came from a passionate, inspired place of love. And it's the only place I want you to be. Come back to first love. Matthew twenty two thirty seven 37 says, The first and most important commandment is this, that you would love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. That's number one. The whole vision of kingdom life, where we want to get to, what we want to create, is a culture that values intimacy with God above everything else. Not just a corporate intimacy where we come together and we feel the presence, but I'm saying individual to individual, every single day, each of us are going into that secret place where Jesus told us our Father's already waiting for us. He's already in that secret place, already waiting for you. That's what the most valuable thing we could possibly cultivate, preach, and tell you about. God wants to know you. He wants you to be head over heels in love with him because he is head over heels in love with you. There's something we say here a lot of times, and we stole it from somebody smarter, but God loves you all the way, 100%, right now. He doesn't love some future version of yourself when you get yourself together. He loves you all the way, imperfect, broken you, right now. 
Just like the prodigal son, he was broken at rock bottom, walking back and having lines rehearsed in his head of what he was going to say to his father after he abandoned him, said, Dad, I wish you were dead. Can I just have my inheritance? And goes and squanders it in a foreign land. Coming back to his father, he says, I have all these lines. Just treat me like a servant. Just do these. Okay, I got the whole spiel played out. He starts coming back. He says his father was waiting for him. He saw him a long way off because he was keeping lookout just in case his son would come home. It says he sprinted out to meet him put a new ring on his finger, a new robe on his shoulders, and his son started his rehearsed lines that he was rehearsing from however many towns and miles over. Starts his rehearsed lines, and the father interrupts him and says, all that matters is your home. I love you. Let's, order, let's have a party. Because I want to celebrate you, not because you have your life together, but because you came back to me. Because you came back where you belong. Because my love will travel any distance as soon as you turn around. You don't have to clean yourself up before you come to Jesus. You don't have to get yourself together and get your budget set up or have your relationship sorted out or make sure this addiction is under control or make sure everything is in the closet that can't be exposed when you come to church. He doesn't care about any of those things. He's saying as soon as you repent, as soon as you do a 180 and turn away from what you were doing and towards what God has for you, he says, I'm there sprinting out to you, throwing my arms around you and having my arm around you, walking you all the way back into the house of God with all of your family so we can throw a party for you, so we can celebrate that my son who was once lost is now found, that the one that I created and knit together in his mother womb who was dead is now alive, who was out orphaned has now been adopted into this royal family with authority and with stature and with all these brand new clothes now with God's name on the back of his jersey because this is the family I represent now. He's saying, this is the new truth. This is what I want for you. And if we can really understand what he's done for us, guys, you can't help but respond by saying, thank you. It was by nothing that I'd done. It's only by your grace and your mercy that I am saved, not by any works that I have done so that no man ever anywhere can boast of what he's accomplished. How can we not respond in any other way besides saying, thank you, I love you, I praise you, I'll spend the rest of my life, whether I'm eating or drinking or whatever I do, I'll do it all to the glory of God because you so deserve it. You did it all. Do you guys remember back when you made that commitment, when you realized those things? Do you remember that first time where that really clicked in your head and you're like, oh my gosh. I grew up in church and it never clicked in my head. Until I was in my early 20s, it, it, that was the only time where I was actually like, wait a second, this was for me. It wasn't that he just died and came back to life, that's cool, but he did that and that impacts my personal life. Where I can be transformed, where I can be brand new, where I can walk now intimately with him because he is alive and wants to walk with me. Jesus is saying, even if you're good, even if you feel solid, even if you are in this relationship and are being righteous and are doing the works that I've called you to, I want you to repent and come back to that honeymoon with me. The head over heels, passionate, inspired love is the place where we are given the influence. He's saying, the people I want leading my movement are the ones that are ridiculous, at least a little bit. The ones that I want leading my movement are the ones that aren't afraid to make themselves uncomfortable. Because I'm sending them my Holy Spirit, the comforter, to handle those difficult situations. I'm going to call the people who are willing to live a little bit dangerously and still meek and humble within that danger knowing who we have on our side, knowing who is with us, goes before us. That in the most difficult times we come in contact with the conflict, it says, my Holy Spirit will give you the words to say. We know that we have a confidence that doesn't make sense, that we can give him our anxiety, we can give him our stress, we can give him the difficult things in our life because it says he promises to give us the peace of God that goes beyond understanding and goes beyond any circumstances we might be in. We can have a confidence in him, guys. We can be head over heels in love with him anytime. I'm just preaching words that I've said a hundred times up here and words you've heard every other preacher say a hundred times is all throughout scripture. But man, when you put them all together and preach them out, they go in power. It says that his words never come back void. Can you guys return to that passionate first date type of love 
where you're willing to spend too much, you're willing to do and go anywhere, you're willing to stay up too late, you're willing to drive the distance no matter how far it is, that you're willing to do things with people you don't like, that you're willing to go places you wouldn't normally go, that you're ready to live and step out into the dangerous things because you know he's gone before you, that you can really give up the unforgiveness or the bitterness or the scary things or the stressful things or the anxiety in your life. You can really give that to him because he really will give you supernatural peace. This morning, we're looking at this scripture in Revelation 2 where Jesus says you're doing good, but I still want you to repent and come back. I want you guys to remember all of the passion. I want you to come back to your first love. Will you guys bow your heads and close your eyes with me? Jesus, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you for doing everything. Thank you that my salvation, my new life isn't dependent on me, but that you did the heavy lifting and transformed me. God, that sort of sacrifice, that sort of steadfastness to remain perfect your whole life, to walk willingly into torture and death when you could have stopped it at any point, that you knew that your crucifixion would pay the penalty on every single other person's life. Jesus, when you died, the old covenant ended. And when you came back, when you rose victoriously over death, over the devil, over our sin, and that veil that separated your presence from from us was torn in two, you came back to new life so that we could walk with you, so that we could be forgiven of everything, so that we could be brought into your family God, I pray that you would settle that into people's hearts, how much you loved us. That even when we were your enemies, like the song said, when I was your foe, still your love fought for me. You didn't just forgive us for being your enemy, God. You adopted us into your family. God, I pray that this would stir up our affections inside of us. That we would fall in love with you all over again here this morning that any area of our life where we've been satisfied with righteous works or correct behaviors or even behavioral modification, God, that those things would not satisfy, that that is not where influence, that is not where transformation, that is not where the world being transformed is found. God, it comes in passionate, wholehearted, ridiculous love for you, a willingness to let go of our comforts, to pursue after you. Jesus, thank you, thank you, thank you for everything you've done for us. Guys, as we're, laying, as we're talking here and praying right now, this is the time to repent, where it's talking about in this scripture. I know a lot of the people that, we're here, that are here this morning are saved and know Jesus. Jesus says, but I have this against you. You have abandoned the passionate love you had for me at the beginning. Think about how how far you have fallen. Repent and do the works of love you did at first. I will come to you and I will remove the lampstand from its place of influence if you do not repent. Down in verse 7 it says, he who has an ear, let him hear what the spirit of the Spirit says to the churches and to the one who conquers, to the one who overcomes, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Over and over again through these letters, he has promises for the one who overcomes, for the one who conquers. So guys, this morning, I want to invite you guys to repent. Come back to the first love. 
come back to that passionate, inspired love you had at the beginning that motivated all of your work, that motivated all of your action, that motivated all of your relationships, every decision you make. Well, he won't, God wants it to be motivated by your love for him. So this morning as we're wrapping up, and ministry team, if you wouldn't mind coming up here to the front with me. If you guys want to make an action within this idea of repentance. We want to invite you to come and pray with us, to come and make that stand and take that stand with us. We want to walk alongside of you in it. Thank you for loving us so much, God, that you were able to transform our hearts. We give them right back to you, God. We say this is yours. We want your Holy Spirit to comfort us. We want your supernatural peace to come upon us. We want that joy in all circumstances we love you. We submit our lives to you, and we repent to that first love. Thank you, Jesus. We pray these things in your name. Amen.